a linguistic seminar or thing. You must have done it here. Um, my name is Julia Sullivan. I'm standing in for Sheila Sharp, who uh, arranges these uh, seminars, but unfortunately has uh, a course in another department which she has to teach at the moment at this time. I'm going to try and sort that one out for the next term, though. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Elliot Bannister, who uh, graduated from this August institution in 2014. 2014. He in Arabic and Persian, and then he says, went in lost, of the lost Bedouin tribe and found himself in Dakota. Um, and found the, instead the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, <coughs> with whom he now works as their linguistic consultant. Yes. Thank you very much. How me taku epina, lila chante wa shte na pechi uza pelo na, lila wiyushki yon wa glie lo, cha le omakha inska krokta numpa sam ake topa kon heha wo onspe ewa ki honi yalo, cha lila chante wa shte wa glie lo. Elliot Machiapi na shaglashe makhot shele le mataha ya shwana akichi tahanska le otronwa hewa akichi tahanska yapi chaka kia watielo ina waslolha ekta watielo ina Julia Echiapi na ha ate Mark Echiapi na ha trunkashila Peter na Stan Echiapi na ha onchiwa eki Pamela na ha Molly Echiapi cha le mitiwa hela le mielo so good afternoon my relatives and i shake your hand with a happy heart and i'm uh, very happy to be back here at soas um, my name is elliot and i'm from here originally but i um, live and work now at a uh, little town of about 900 people called fort yates which is on the standing rock indian reservation which straddles north and south dakota um, my parents' names are Mark and Julia. My grandparents are Peter, Stan, Molly, and Pamela. And I give you this information because when we um, introduce ourselves in the Lakota way, you always tell people who your family are and where you're from so that, uh, so that people can um, identify you and work out whether you're a goodie or a baddie. So I'll leave you to, to make up that, uh, that decision. Uh, I always think it's kind of good to um, uh, give details about yourself not only kind of from that traditional point of view but in this academic sense um, before I kind of launch into this presentation uh, just a kind of statement of positionality so um, as I say I grew up here in the UK um, I work now as the language specialist for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe which um, is a uh, which is fantastic work and uh, I'm very privileged to be able to do that and so as we kind of go into this presentation, as I start to discuss the topics I want to discuss today, I want to kind of keep this in mind. So a few pointers to kind of, you know, so you can decide how many pinches of salt you want to uh, take my words with. Um, I work there as a washichu, as a white person, and obviously that carries an immense amount of privilege. It has its advantages as well as its disadvantages in this particular brand of community work. Um, I live in the community as an outsider. Um, I could very easily leave the reservation if I wanted to. I don't, but I, I could. And I think these are um, just, uh, you know, pointers to bear in mind. Um, I was educated at one of the world's finest institutions right here. Uh, I don't have any formal linguistics training. I'm not a linguist, um, according to myself, according to some others. I am, but my interest in language revitalization as a whole is really in uh, the role it plays as a kind of tool for social justice and um, the, the power it can have in um, uh, enhancing and kind of forwarding the way of life uh, out there on the reservation. So this is where I'm based. It's the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, just a kind of brief introduction to the nation. It is a sovereign nation. Uh, what I mean by that is that it is independent and um, has a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States, which means that by law, the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, in fact, the newly elected chairman, they had their elections just last week, uh, the chairman is on equal standing with um, the president of the United States, or Wagmotranka, the great pumpkin, as he's better known out there. Um, for 
uh, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, which was signed in 1868, it was the treaty that set aside this particular sect of land for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and much more besides. The original borders of, of that treaty extended all the way to the uh, everywhere west of the Missouri River and into the surrounding states, so North Dakota, Wyoming to the west, and Nebraska to the south. Over time, in 1877, there was a shiny yellow rock that was discovered in the Black Hills, and the United States decided to go back on the treaty promises they had made, and gradually, over time, uh, those reservation boundaries have become smaller and smaller. Um, and now the, uh, the size of the reservation as it exists now is uh, this little blue kind of triangle shape, which is actually a fairly sizable piece of land. It's about half the size of Wales, um, which seems to be the, uh, the reference that people always give. Um, this slightly lighter blue color is the original boundaries of the Fort Laramie Treaty, that treaty signed in 1868. So you can see just how much land has been stolen over over um, that time. The other reservations here marked in dark blue are also Lakota and Dakota reservations. Um, collectively, um, these people are known as the Ocheti Shakoi. This means the seven council fires. And those seven refer to four bands of Western Dakota, uh, two bands of, sorry, four bands of Eastern Dakota, two bands of Western Dakota, and the Lakota people themselves. Now, all of the languages that these uh, nations speak are mutually intelligible. They could be considered dialects of the same language. And we'll discuss in a moment the usefulness or lack thereof of dividing these into distinct dialects or languages. Uh, Lakota and Dakota are official languages of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And part of, my, part of the work that we do in my department is um, getting a language and culture code written into the constitution of the tribe uh, with the purpose of full revitalization for the language. Now, just to give um, the term, the, the name Standing Rock might be familiar because of the, um, the, the prominence that uh, it had in headlines all across the world, really, in the latter part of 2016. Um, this was the, the battle that the um, Standing Rock Sioux tribe were fighting in defense of their water rights. And I just want to show this little clip. Um, for those who have never heard a Lakota victory song, and for those um, who, uh, who hadn't heard of that issue, I just wanted to show this little introduction. Drum beats, cheers, and tears. The sound of victory for the Standing Rock Sioux and thousands of others gathered to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. This massive humanity living off the grid, joined by thousands of military veterans, helped exert so much political and legal pressure, effectively forcing the pipeline to be rerouted. People who have uh, said that uh, this is uh, either a making or breaking, and uh, I just thought we made it. The pipeline was almost to the river when it was halted by the Army Corps of Engineers, so we could take another look at the path. Sunday, officials decided it was a no-go. For months, the Sioux Nation had been demanding the project be scrapped. They were convinced the pipeline carrying crude oil underneath the Missouri River would one day leak, poisoning the drinking water of millions downriver. This is too much of a risk. To the drinking water, to the thousands of people standing on Sioux Nation. Too much of a risk for the, the sacred sites all along that route in this area. And too much of a risk for us as a planet. The pipeline's planned route did not go through Indian reservation land, but the tribe argued the water is part of treaty land, and therefore it too must agree to its path. So, a couple of um, very important figures within contemporary Lakota life that were featured in that, in that video: Chief Arvel Looking Horse, who is the keeper of the sacred uh, medicine bundle, the the white buffalo calf woman pipe, and therefore the carrier of the most important. Um, uh, item within, the, within Lakota spirituality. And Dallas Goldtooth, who heads up the Indigenous Environment Network, which is an advocacy organization. And I mention this not because this relates directly to the, um, the topic of today's presentation, but because it's essential to acknowledge what is going on here at Standing Rock. Um, it placed Standing Rock really at the forefront of indigenous resistance, and it still you know, it carries that responsibility today. 
eventually once the Great Pumpkin came into power, the pipeline was approved and uh, oil started flowing through it um, at the start of June 2017, but it's still being fought in the courts and, um, and the battle for kind of land and water goes on. Now, the, uh, the way that it's seen within traditional culture is that the land and the language are intrinsically related. Um, this is true from a kind of intersectional point of view. It's true from a traditional point of view that the language belongs to the land. Um, and words, conjugations, syntactic structures, anything like that cannot exist in isolation. It is always a reflection of creation of the world around us. I want to quote um, Hankashi Tibiziwi, who is a colleague who works at one of the immersion schools in Lakota country. She says, I truly believe that our language is tied to our land. How many years our land has heard our language? I just believe it belongs here. And as such, I just want to kind of frame the rest of this presentation within that, um, within that idea of decolonization, that this return of the traditional language is tied very directly to the return of traditional land. And every project that I talk about today, I want us to consider in that kind of decolonization framework. How useful is, are these projects to re-empowering people? How useful are they in terms of, uh, you know, what sort of power structures do they promote? And how can they help us reclaim land and water and our rightful place within the world as a nation? Uh, I'm a second language learner. I'm not a native speaker of Lakota. So, um, so now I, and I always thought I was all alone, in, in, and I think I was for many years. But now I can see that, that there's this movement. And to me, the, uh, to me I, I'm relatively detached from whether Lakota language becomes you know, fully revitalized. I think it would be nice. But the exciting thing to me is it just represents a shift in consciousness. It represents a, like, a, like a, a coming into wakefulness. It represents like people realizing there's something beautiful in the heritage. People realizing that we have something wonderful and essential to contribute towards an emerging global civilization. So this is um, a gentleman called Kevin Locke. He is a renowned hoop dancer and spiritual leader at Standing Rock Reservation. His Lakota name is Trokahia Inaji, the first to arise. And what struck me about this particular interview is his attitude towards full, re full revitalization. It would be nice, he says, but is that really the point? It's the process of revitalization that he's invested in. It's that process of reclamation. And, um, and that's the kind of um, the frame that I'm going to put this presentation in. So with that said, let's talk speaker numbers. So very important stuff, speaker numbers. The US Census in 2000 put 15% of the Sioux population as speakers of the language. And by Sioux, we mean the Ocheti Shakoi, the seven council fires. That's the Lakota and Dakota nations. So about 15,000 people were fluent speakers in 2000. Ethnologue in 2015 estimated 6,000 Lakota speakers and about 18,000 Dakota speakers. So let's see, in 15 years we've gained 9,000 speakers. This is good progress. Rising Voices, which is a documentary that we'll be seeing clips of throughout this presentation, uh, is also quoting uh, 6,000 Lakota speakers in 2015. In 2016, February of 2016, the Lakota Language Consortium, which is an organization uh, that was involved with the production of the film, reassessed those figures and came out with a more realistic 2,100 first language speakers of Lakota, plus about 100 second language learners, and then maybe another hundred who speak the Dakota dialect instead. Meanwhile, the Dakota Iapi Okodakichie, which is an advocacy organization for the Dakota dialect, estimated more like five speakers of Dakota within Minnesota, which is the traditional uh, homelands of the Dakota, and maybe about 20 in other states, so altogether about 25 speakers. So 
what happened between February 2016 and May 2016 that caused such a uh, monumental loss of speakers? Um, you know, what's going on? Could it be that just nobody really knows how many speakers there are? Uh, you know, could it be that it's actually incredibly difficult to carry out a scientific, you know, house-to-house -house survey of, of speaker numbers? Could it be that it's too difficult to measure fluency? What does fluency even mean when you say, my grandma is a fluent speaker? Could it also be that numbers in these different contexts are there to serve a certain purpose? You know, they say that 73% of statistics are made up. I believe that to maybe be the case here too. So uh, that just goes to show you, you don't need to trust anything I say in this presentation. Um, this idea of, you know, the purposes that these numbers are serving are talked about in an article by Jane Hill in 2002. She talks about expert rhetoric, um, which are these common themes that the experts, us linguists, use when we're setting the scene to talk about language endangerment and language revitalization. One of those is the idea of universal ownership. These languages belong to all of us, and we must work to save them. Another is hyperbolic valorization. These languages are precious. They contain um, uh, you know, immeasurable knowledge and wisdom. And number three is this habit of enumeration, alarming statistics. Only five speakers left, only 2,100 speakers left. Uh, so why, why is this happening? Funding, funding is the reason behind all of these varying statistics. Or so media attention too. When you send out a press release saying there are now only 2,000 speakers left, that leads to media attention and that again leads to funding, which is something that is desperately needed in, uh, in the field. Uh, Hill, also in this article, suggests that these numbers can have an impact on communities. Quoting these random statistics that are pulled from proverbials, you know, has a real impact on communities. She quotes Mulhoisler in another article who said that the vast collections of numbers, these vast collections of numbers, are a major form of knowledge in colonial regimes. So if you bombard people with numbers enough, uh, that is a way of exerting control. They're meant to be scary. They're meant to uh, encourage this feeling of loss. But, you know, it also imposes this burden of responsibility, too. In that same press release, I just wanted to quote uh, a gentleman called Ben Blackbear, who is a fluent speaker, an elder. He's a member of the board of that particular organization who put out the press release. And he expresses that negativity isn't necessarily useful for the fluent speakers whom we're purportedly helping. From the outside perspective, the language is in critical condition. But from the inside, from those of us living and speaking it, we just need to look at ourselves in a positive way to move the language forward. And Hill, in her paper, suggests that there are alternatives to these, this kind of expert rhetoric. That if you actually listen to how it's talked about in the community, it's always talked about in human terms. You know, these are people with names, they're relatives um, who you've known and loved and who have walked on and who you've lost. And uh, that's how it's talked about, never in terms of statistics. So moving the language forward, I like that phrase that he uses, you know, as a synonym to revitalization or uh, revival. Um, he's talking about the language as a living language. And what we're doing is we're progressing with it. So, uh, just a few of the projects at Standing Rock that are ongoing to move the language forward. The picture we see here is from La Khol Iapi Wahokbi, which is a 100% uh, uh, Lakota language immersion environment. There are about 20 kids who attend four days a week, and it's divided into two schools essentially. La Khol Iapi Wahokbi is up to first grade, and then second and Third, which is the highest level that it currently goes to, are at Wichakini, uh, Oiowa. There are three fluent um, elders who teach in the nest. There are also second language teachers or second language learners who are working as teachers. Um, so that is one of the most powerful projects that is ongoing. Can you translate the names for 
Yeah, so la kol iapi wahokpi. Wahokpi is literally a nest. So la kol iapi is the Lakota word for the Lakota language. So it's the Lakota language nest. Wichakini is something like um, revival or um, recovery, maybe. So it's the revival school, Wichakini Owaiawa. The third program, and this is one that I'm going to kind of focus on a little later in the presentation, is Khpechashni on Spech Ichiapi, which is a project at Sitting Bull College, the tribal college on Standing Rock. And it's funded by the National Science Foundation. It provides funding for 10 very capable students to study the Lakota language intensely for four hours a day five days a week. So they are getting four hours of intensive Lakota language classes every day. And the idea is that they will be brought as close to fluency as possible by the end of an academic year. These are people who have been identified as capacity. They could be future teachers, they could be using the language with their own children, they could be leaders within the movement. And so, um, uh, a college course of this vigor has never been taught for the Lakota language. Four hours a day at college level two. We're talking teaching college at college. We're talking complex subject matter. And that's never been done. So that is a project that I'm going to come back to a little later on in this um, presentation. And a master apprentice program which will be starting in spring next year. So 10 hours a week, direct contact, a learner and a fluent speaker, engaging in everyday interactive activities. So let's talk about texts, which is one of the main themes of the talk today. English speakers can read Shakespeare, they can read the Bible, they can watch television with their kids and laugh at all the stupid things that all the cartoon characters say. They can read newspapers from all over the world in English, and that is part of their basic social identity and part of a national culture. And that's why no one who's an English speaker would want to lose their language. In the same way, Lakota people want to reinvigorate their language. So that was um, Joe Allen Arshambo, who um, is a researcher at the Natural History Museum, part of the Smithsonian Institution. And when we're talking about texts here, I'm not only referring to written texts. We're talking about any kind of permanent record of the language. So that could be written text or it could be um, recording, audio recordings too. Now, obviously, as our Shambo says, um, uh, Lakota has virtually no written history, no written um, literature or text corpus in comparison with the English language. But if you compare it to most Native American languages, Lakota is actually very, very well documented indeed. It's uh, at least the, uh, it's probably uh, the most, if not the second most, um, well documented language in North America. Going back to the 1830s, um, when missionaries started to live and work amongst the Dakota, the Eastern Dakota, so that's the, uh, the bands living over in Minnesota, that part of the country. Two brothers, Samuel and Gideon Pond, um, put down a lot of stories into writing. And a, another missionary named Stephen Riggs, who worked with a number of different speakers, and I always like to mention their names because these texts are often referred to as the Riggs texts and not by the names of the speakers who actually gifted these stories in the first place. So Michael Renville, David Greycloud, Walking Elk, James Garvey, and many others. And also newspapers, newspaper projects, some of which were more long living than others, which began um, amongst the missionaries too. Examples are the Dakota Trawashit Kuki, the Dakota friend, Ampao, which means daybreak, a bit like the sun, but in Dakota. And Iapi o Aye, which is the word carrier. There are Lakota texts as well, um, dating back to a little later on, so 1890s. Um, the image we see here is an image of George Sword, who was a Oglala Lakota, so he was from Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. 
He, along with George Bush Otter, Edgar Fire Thunder, Alex Charging Crow, um, began to put some of their stories and memoirs and autobiographies down in writing. In the early 1900s, another missionary by the name of Eugene uh, Beagle, it's um, kind of a corruption of whatever the original German pronunciation is, but they call him Beagle, that's how they pronounce it. And Ivan Starr Sr., who was one of his consultants, they worked together with speakers to put down um, a text into writing. So Brave Dog, Little Cloud, Bad Yellow Hair, all of these people we have to be grateful for, for the stories that they gave us. And then Francis Densmore, who you might have come across in kind of musical ethnography, um, she not only recorded a lot of Lakota songs, but also narratives that go along, the stories behind the songs. Uh, later on in the 20th century, a woman by the name of Ella Deloria um, was an incredibly important um, part of this effort to document the language. She is a Dakota woman herself. She grew up with fluent speaking parents. She grew up in a fluent household and um, went away to, I think, Columbia University and trained with Franz Boas. So um, she learned kind of the, uh, the technical side of language documentation and returned to her own people to, to start documenting her language. She recorded an, uh, a huge amount of work monologues, dialogues, and often these are the subject matter are legends, uh, mythology, memoirs. Uh, and she worked primarily with monolingual speakers. So at this time, there was still, you know, the vast majority of the Lakota population was still monolingual, um, which certainly isn't the case now. The social outlook of her informants has always kind of been questioned. It's, it's, it's uh, from personal communication I've had with researchers into Ella Deloria. She tended to work with um, social outcasts, um, those who had a kind of outside perspective on their own society. And that reflects itself somewhat in some of the stories she's put down. And then a huge amount of documentation has been done in the modern period too. So um, from the 1950s Onwards, audio, a lot of audio recordings have been made of the language too. So James Emery was a, um, I think an Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge too, who started making recordings of his own relatives. In the 1960s, a huge amount of recording was done with people like Frank Fool's Crow, a CD of which was gifted to me earlier today. Thank you very much for that. Um, Spotted Eagle, Black Horse, Schweigman, Kills in Sight, Bee Medicine, a, uh, an, an anthropologist, Pete Catches, and all of these um, are stored at the University of South Dakota, and they were made, uh, the interviewees were, um, uh, the interviews were done by a number of different people. And then since then, a number of private collections have emerged too. In the 1970s, an anthropologist called Ray DeMalley, who works out of Indiana University, made recordings with speakers on Cheyenne River Reservation, the next res south from Standing Rock. In the 1990s, Don Moccasin made a lot of recordings at Rosebud. Uh, Regina Pustet made recordings with Lakota people living in Denver, Colorado, which is quite a way away from Lakota country, but it was one of the relocation cities, so there's a um, a surprisingly high uh, proportion of Lakota speakers in Denver. And then a linguist, a Czech linguist by the name of Jan Ulrich has made several uh, recordings with several hundred speakers across Lakota country. He's done an incredible amount of documentation work. We'll come back to some of that in a moment. There's also a small number of speakers who are writing their language as well in different formats. Um, Ivan Starr, Francis Apple, Archie Bove um, are uh, a few of the most prolific writers in Lakota country. And the Lakota Country Times, which is kind of a national newspaper, um, uh, is, tends to be the medium that carries these, uh, these written texts. The example we have up here is a text by Francis Apple uh, titled, Ehani Lakota ki wicha akich ankeapi. So a long time ago, the Lakota people were starving, they say. And it's a text about how, um, how the Lakota were forced to migrate during starvation. <coughs> and then the cartoon says, grandson, 
don't play with your food. And it's a boy playing with a dog. It's a very sacred food within the Lakota tradition. So um, the fact that we have so much documentation of the language has meant that uh, you know, historical linguists um, have been able to identify changes that have occurred. And these changes have been identified by Ulrich as uh, you know, three different types. One is natural language change. And uh, an example is the loss, gradual loss of palatalization. So historically, um, uh, what was often a j sound has eventually become a g sound. Um, for example, if I said, um, let's see, sapechi uh, historically meant the black one, but if I nowadays you'd hear it as sapechi, so that j has been lost and replaced by a g sound. Language attrition, so the conflation of certain features of the language ge and geha are nowadays more or less interchangeable. One, is a, uh, one was historically a definite article and the other was a future time clause marker, so a kind of adverbial marker, and they're more or less used interchangeably now. And then, of course, English influence too. We don't have any monolingual speakers of the Lakota language today, so all of, uh, all of the speech that occurs today is somewhat influenced by by the English language. And a, a nice example of that is, uh, or I guess a clear example of that is the way that inalien inalienable nouns are often used in structures which were traditionally only used for alienable nouns. So by inalienable nouns, I mean things which intrinsically belong to you, your relatives, your body parts, um, your spirit, your voice. Um, things like this, whereas alienable nouns are things that you can get rid of, possessions that don't really belong to us. And historically, um, fluent speakers would express um, their relationship to inalienable nouns in such ways as uh, my son exists. Not, it means I have a son, but it's expressed in a different way. Nowadays, you'll often hear people say Literally, I, I possess a son, is how you might literally translate it, but that's one of the examples of how English has had an impact on Lakota syntax. So, if there are so many texts, um, why am I giving this presentation about the difficulties that we face in um, engaging the community with them? And I've identified five main challenges that we face in accessing the text corpus. One of them is geography. You know, where these manuscripts, where these recordings are physically located. Number two, the format and nature of the texts are some, sometimes um, inaccessible to complete beginners of the language. Number three, we're going to look at the authenticity of the text, working out how much of the text corpus is real, authentic, fluent language. Four, um, the idea of writing uh, the Lakota language is generally accepted nowadays, but attitudes towards writing the language are very, very nuanced, and I want to look a little bit at, at how those opinions differ. And number five, as is often the case with endangered languages, the orthography issue. So people not being able to agree about which spelling system to use or um, having an opposition to using certain material written in a certain way. Let's start with the first one. This map, um, so the, the, the red peg up there is the Standing Rock Reservation. And I've just marked on these blue pegs to show where some of those archaic Dakota and Lakota texts. So those texts from the late 1800s, or the, the mid 1800s and the early 1900s, where they're located. They're all over the place. They're at the Colorado Historical Society, University of Oklahoma, um, Berkeley, um, the Marquette University in Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota Historical Society in Minnesota, some university in Michigan, the Smithsonian, um, Library of Congress, various places on the East Coast too. So geographically completely inaccessible to the Lakota community, which is uh, who live in North and South Dakota. 
as you can see, there are a few pegs. You know, these tend to be tribal colleges and so on that do hold um, archive materials too, but generally quite inaccessible. And this is just looking at the archive, you know, the, the kind of um, archaic text too. If we look at more modern recordings, you know, the recordings made from the 1970s onwards, we're going to be looking even further east. We're going to be looking at Europe. Uh, texts which are uh, made by linguists and stored on their computers and not shared in a kind of open source, or not necessarily open source, but um, a way that gives back to the community that they were uh, gifted by. Standing Rock itself has a um, provision in the tribal a code of justice which says that any person or entity intending to conduct research on the residents, members, and or resources of the reservation shall first complete an application with a city board college institution or review board. Um, and no data collection may be conducted by a research until this approval is obtained. And a copy of all results of the research under this section shall be provided to and maintained at the college and researchers shall abide by the ethical principles and respect for the persons, beneficiaries, and justice. All researchers shall respect the culture of the residents of the reservation when designing and executing proposed research. All researchers shall follow the guidelines and procedures developed by the college and the IRB for the protection of human subjects. So basically, any research that gets done at Standing Rock Reservation must be deposited at Sydney Bull College too. The reality is that is and that is not the case. Um, it could be that it's not very well enforced. Uh, it's not very strictly enforced. It could be that research has come onto the reservation without seeking approval in the first place. So really, this sort of, this sort of provision, as laid out in this code of justice, relies on the ethical standpoint of the of the linguist, of the researcher, and their understanding that it is important to to give these recordings back to the community. There are a couple of um, instances of repatriation that have happened in the past couple of years. Um, this one from 2008, I mentioned James Emery, who was the Oglala Lakota who started making recordings in the 1950s. Um, he gifted over 300 old recordings to the Oglala Lakota College, which is the equivalent of Sitting Bull College, but for the southern part of Lakota country. Um, and uh, these, these recordings that he made preserve some of the old songs that had otherwise been forgotten. Here's another nice example. So the language summit he's referencing there is literally called the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota language summit. He's not just uh, tripping over the auto cue. Um, but this happened in October of last year, and it was a very special um, moment because, you know, with the repatriation of this material, it's not just about the linguistic content, or in this case, the, the, um, the content of the songs, but it's this repatriation of trust as well that exists between the Library of Congress and the tribe itself. Let's talk a little bit about linguistic authenticity that I mentioned. When we talk about an authentic text, what I'm referencing is a text that is being produced by a fluent speaker for a fluent speaker. Okay, So it's speech or language that has emerged in its natural environment, 
It's not language that's been designed for a textbook, for example. Um, a lot of translational material does exist as well, works that have been translated from English and other languages into Lakota. Of course, translation is an art or a science, whichever way you want to look at it, that requires a real um, intricate intuition of both languages, of the structure of both languages. And um, often if the translator doesn't have that, then, then the resulting text is not necessarily good or useful for learners of the language. So examples of translational texts, there's a lot of liturgical literature, Bibles, um, uh, stories of uh, various biblical characters that have been put into the language by those early missionaries, Stephen Riggs and Eugene um, Beagle, among others. In recent years, TV commercials, um, there is a bank called the Black Hills Federal Credit Union that's actually put out a couple of TV adverts in the language, which is kind of cool, um, but you know, it's scripted in English and then translated into, into Lakota. Uh, movies, Dances with Wolves, anyone seen it? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's good in the sense that you know, a, lot of the, a, a lot of the script is in Lakota and it was translated by fluent speakers, but the actors were not fluent speakers themselves and the language therefore is, the, the resulting language is kind of questionable. There's another, film that's coming out this month called Woman Walks Ahead um, about a, a white woman who uh, develops a kind of deep friendship with Sitting Bull. It's based on a true story and again the script had been translated into Lakota and um, taught syllable by syllable to the actors. Um, and one of the criticisms of these types of projects, another one I want to mention is the Berenstein Bears. Um, which, uh, does anyone know the Berenstein Bears? So I, I had never come across them in England. So when I went to Lakota country, I, I assumed it was like they only ever spoke Lakota, but I was told they originally spoke English and they'd been dubbed into Lakota, but there's 20 episodes. It was a monumental project and Standing Rock was um, uh, one of the co-partners on that project. Um, so 20 episodes of the cartoon dubbed into the language and this is the first kind of TV programming that had been done for the language. Um, and pretty much apart from these adverts remains to be the only TV programming that's been put into the language. So um, it's incredibly, it's a powerful project in that sense because it, it represents Lakota and Dakota language entering new um, contemporary realms. On the other hand, um, uh, the stories were designed for American English speaking audiences and I quote um, a fluent elder from Shine River Reservation, Stephanie Charging Eagle, who says it's an English show but it's been taken and translated into Lakota. So what you have now is a Lakota story with washichu thought, washichu thinking, that means white man's thinking. What really should be happening is that we tell our stories in Lakota to our children so that they understand where they come from. So there is you know, criticism to these projects as well as the advantages they bring. And I, I, I see the advantage in both. You know, I agree with Charging Eagle that original stories do matter. We should be doing both. Let's talk a little bit about um, this, the attitudes to writing the language in the first place actually putting the Lakota language down into writing. Uh, this is a, a newspaper excerpt written by Francis Apple, again, for the Lakota Country Times. And he tells a story about the white buffalo calf woman um, who, was, who brought the traditions to the people in the, in, the, uh, in the beginning of time. He says, well, he's written it in Lakota, but I shall read the English translation that he's put underneath. When the white buffalo calf woman brought the buffalo calf pipe to the oyate, to the people, she taught them for four days about the teachings that go with it. Ptesanwi, that is the white buffalo calf woman, her final instruction went something like this. Listen carefully. Whenever you put this sacred language that the Creator gave you on paper, you will cease to be a nation. Um, 
it will cease to be a nation. Um, you know, it's a slight irony that he wrote this for a, <laughs> for a newspaper that was published in print, but um, the idea that you lose something, you lose the sacredness of the language, and with so much that's already been taken away from the people, that is one thing that they have left. On the other hand, there are other writers, Ivan Starr, again writing for the Lakota Country Times, who said, My belief about the language is that we will have ours in writing. The language will recover only if we encourage the whole nation to speak it. People will write books in the language and treat it as their first language. Trokahe means first to treat something as, it's, as your first. So there are advocates of writing too. The stories have values, the Lakota stories have values. There is something that you know, the moral of that story, and, but if you read it, it's not, it's just, you read it and it's gone. But if somebody has come to our classroom and talk about the stories, and the moral of that, what did you get out of that? What was so important? That's why I believe in oral storytelling. That's because I was always asked to do this at the Sundance uh, Youth Camp. And I, I try to you know, tell stories that there's morals to it. Because that's the way these stories were. And a long, long time ago, how our stories have come. Even in when you go out hunting, or even to make a hide, a scrape a hide, or to you know, lead work and all that. There's always a moral to that story. And one that I like about that, uh, he's no longer with us, Mr. White Hat, is how you know, one um, was a cousin that was so uh, appreciative of her male cousin, so she started leading. Um, so moccasins for him for an appreciation for looking after her. And she said to him, Lena Ohan. So what that uh, <laughs> may have cousin understand is Ohan means to cook something. So he went out and boiled the water and he put those little beautiful moccasins in it. <laughs> Anyone get that joke? <laughs> so Lena Ohan. Um, it's a synonym. She's playing with synonyms. Oha means to boil something, but it also means to put something on your feet. So this cousin had made this beautiful pair of moccasins for her cousin and um, told him, Lena Oha, so he threw them straight in the water. This is um, Onchi Dolores Taken Alive, who is, uh, is one of the most fluent elders, very eloquent Lakota speaker at Standing Rock, and one of the co-teachers with me on the Khpe Chashni on Spech Ichiapi course that I mentioned earlier that I'll touch on in just a minute. Um, I'll skip over that for the sake of time. It's really exciting. I always tell my colleagues in the tribal government that uh, we should probably continue to, we should probably draft a, a lot of our policies, uh, everything in writing that we do in our language. Now, understanding that our language back in the day wasn't written but for the purposes of advancement, you know, and, and growth as a society, uh, we see the need to write it. And now we are, uh, we've developed a way among some linguists uh, to write it in a different fa uh, fashion uh, where non-speakers, non once they read the way it's written, uh, when they read the sentences or, or, they, or say a word, and the way it's written, it used to sound like they've been speaking for, for a long time. Jesse Taken Alive, a um, former chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and another very fluent speaker. And what he's talking about here is um, a learner's orthography that was developed to help people pronounce the words as they would have been pronounced a hundred years ago. Um, some of these interviews are mine, others are, uh, this one included, produced by the South Dakota Department of Education. Um, they've done a lot of documentation in English 
um, of elders' knowledge. So this question of orthographies, I don't want to get too deeply into this because it's a subject that, you know, a lot of heat and not a whole lot of light has been uh, generated from. But if we just contrast some of the different writing systems that exist for the language, um, you possibly can't see it at this, at this resolution, but um, suffice to say that these are three very different ways of writing the same thing. If we look, for example, at how um, nasal vowels are represented, so the ah sound, in the Deloria orthography, we have a little um, ogonek underneath the vowel like they do in Polish, right? Um, in the white hat orthography, it's an N with a long tail. In this orthography, it's an N with a long tail and a flick. Three different ways of writing the same sound. Ah, uh, the nasal sound. Can like, It's a little clearer. So let's look at these two words, for example, keapi here, K-E-Y-A-P-I with an acute accent on the E. Contrast that with keapi right at the top there, K with a bar on top of it, P with a bar on top of it, and that's to represent the unaspirated ga, or the gu and bu sounds. So in this particular orthography, you don't mark unaspirated sounds. In the white hat of orthography, you do. So very different approaches. Um, and, uh, you know, um, my general feeling is that whatever orthography people want to use to ensure they're teaching the language and passing it on, that's good. It, um, but there are, um, there's a lot of disagreement in the community. And it's related to power structures, of course, you know, who devised the orthography in the first place. Um, what efforts have been made in the schools to teach that to the children. Um, so uh, there's still a lot of kind of emotional and um, historical baggage associated with these orthographies. This, and you don't need to see this in detail, I just want you to see um, uh, how many different orthographies have been created for this language. This was a survey done by a, a Spanish researcher called Corral Esteban. And all of these down this side are different orthographies, so 20 plus different orthographies for Lakota. And each of these have maybe two or three materials produced in that orthography. So um, it's gradually shifting. It's gradually shifting. There are, in different communities, different orthographies which are becoming the norm. Over in Dakota country, there's one that's um, uh, advocated for by the University of Minnesota. At Standing Rock, we tend to use um, the Ulrich orthography. One place to find fluent speakers is the Lakota Summer Institute, held each year at City Hall College in North Dakota. Native speakers come here to learn how to teach the language they've spoken since childhood. Someone who speaks Lakota fluently, who has been raised speaking Lakota fluently, uh, doesn't automatically uh, make you uh, the best Lakota language uh, instructor. Just like myself, I wouldn't be the best English instructor because I, I, I speak without thinking. It's natural to, to try and explain sentence structure, verbs, conjugations in English, but I have to go to school to learn everything that I needed to, to teach the students and that's what uh, a lot of fluent speakers are, are here for as well. In one writing class, the Loris Tegelman reads a short story by Sandra Blackman. The Suchoya is written by Sandra Blackman. <laughs> Thank you. 
ci ma noi non fare per noi se non c'è di una che ne vuole ciò che ne vuole The class that I had there was uh, actually was a process writing class, and we were trying to get these speakers, the Hoka language speakers, to the point where they will write material that they could use in the classroom. They can structure it so that it's easy for young children to read it in Hoka. Obviously, despite all of this documentation that has happened, the most important resource we have for authentic language are our fluent speakers. So any projects which encourage them to start putting that down into writing is a beneficial one. Now, this is not necessarily a representative sample of elders. These guys are advocates for this particular orthography. It's not always that um, easily accepted, but... Um, uh, it has helped them start to produce materials for their own classroom. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit because how much time do I have left? Sure, okay. Um, so I want to talk specifically about some of the creative ways that these texts are being um, made accessible again to the communities. And I'll focus on uh, two or three projects, including the college course that we're teaching at the moment. But firstly, some lessons from Alaska. This is Gary Halton, who is uh, writing about the Dena'ina language, um, which has very few speakers, or in the case of the Kenai dialect, no speakers. Um, over 300 documents, including field notes, out-of-print primers, over 300 recordings dating back to the 1950s. Um, and a lot of this material is archived at the Alaska Native Language Center, which is, um, my understanding is that it's some way away from Dena'ina territory. So how to repatriate those materials. And the project that he's um, been involved with is a digitization project. Um, there was a website produced called Dena'ina Kenaga, which is an online digital archive of these resources. And these are the four lessons that he offers to other indigenous communities. Number one, that digital repatriation facilitates new kinds of circulation, so more people, different um, uh, audiences are getting access to the text. Number two, that digitization alone is not sufficient. You have to go above and beyond. You have to find ways for people to engage with the texts. Number three, that uh, well, I think that's what I just said. Must engage with communities to develop and repurpose these materials. So finding a reason for their existence other than just nice, you know, artifacts in an archive. And number four, of course, when the community is involved in driving these efforts, that's when they're the most long-lasting and successful. So these are kind of four um, uh, pieces of guidance that we... Um, are guided by um, when we're looking at projects to do with um, Lakota language uh, texts. One of those, of course, is mass publication of these texts. You know, whereas we could walk into Waterstones and pick out any book, there are about six books, well, five, this one's not even published yet. There are about five books that Lakota people, fluent speakers, can choose from to read their own language. Um, Ella Deloria, who was that um, anthropologist from northern Lakota country, um, published in 1932, and it's been republished since, a, a big collection of mythological works. Um, Professor Ingham um, did a wonderful study into dozens and dozens of texts on the topic of uh, Lakota spirituality, um, how that, the role that spirituality plays in contemporary society and comparisons between Lakota spirituality and um, Judeo-Christian traditions. And these, are, um, these come from a number of um, fluent speakers, including George Bush Otter, Edgar Firethunder, Frank Fools Crow. And finally, people are, um, uh, have access to these. 
Um, digitization, of course, has, um, uh, is a reality for some of those older, more archaic texts. Once they're out of copyright, for example, the Francis Densmore texts were done so long ago that you can kind of find them online. Um, but how to actually uh, encourage engagement and interaction with these texts is, uh, remains a big question. There was a project, an online forum project, that was set up, uh, let's see, about, um, about eight or nine years ago, um, where some of these older texts are published um, uh, online and users on the forum can sign up, they can practice translating little sections of the text, you can double click on words and it will, you know, the dictionary entry for that particular word will pop up. It's, uh, technologically speaking, it's a very beautiful project and, uh, and a successful one. Um, of course, the flip side of digitization is that you, uh, it is then open to everyone in the world. Uh, and um, Tasha Hoff, a colleague of mine who was somewhat critical of this project, is worried about the number of oddballs, essentially, who are attracted to um, uh, attracted to these uh, to these sorts of environments. So she speaks about the um, inadvertent contribution uh, to a broader mm -hmm. phenomenon of non-Indians going native. Uh, and in this way, non-natives learning Lakota today remains part and parcel of the conquest of indigenous peoples. So that's, you know, big words, but um, she d did a study of the users that were um, interacting on that forum most frequently and uh, Germany was a far more active um, country than Standing Rock itself. Um, it, could be, it could be attributed to um, privilege, you know, how much free time you have to spend learning language, um, how much time you have to, you know, do the sort of research that leads you to finding these texts. But that is one of the downsides of publishing and digitizing in a kind of open source way. So, uh, literally means uh, when we first had the group come together at the start of the academic year, we were 10 students and sat around with um, my co-teachers and we said, what, what should we call this group? And the name that was settled on was which means boldly or fervently, full of energy. To teach yourself or to learn. So this is a group of people who are boldly um, setting themselves the task of learning the language to fluency in a year. Um, curriculum, as I say, has never been developed at a kind of college level. So um, the focus that we have when we're developing this curriculum is preserving the authenticity of language. As more and more of our fluent speakers begin to make their journey, these texts that are documented become more and more vital. They become a more important treasure trove for um, fluent language as it was spoken 100 years ago. So I quote Phillips Hill when we talk about authenticity. Um, what he's talking about is the youth, uh, let's see, Certainly these texts must be selected with care so that the student's linguistic competency is balanced with background knowledge, interest, and strategic competencies in ways that render the task challenging but not frustrating. The advice to edit the task and not the text encourages instructional practice where students develop effective interpretive strategies such as contextual guessing, hypothesizing, and confirming or revising those. So that means even as a beginner, when you're interacting with a story that has been documented by a fluent speaker, um, you are presented with the entire story. You listen to the entire recording as it was made, or you read the entire text as it was written down. We don't give extracts, we don't dumb the language down, we don't paraphrase, we give them the entire thing so that they can interact with the text in as uh, full and authentic way as possible but the response that we expect from the students is where their language competency comes into play. So we start with simple tasks. Um, 
And uh, I'm just going to give a quick example of one of those now, as I have about five minutes left. Um, this is a story as it was written down by Ella Deloria from one of her fluent informants, monolingual informant. It's the story of a meadowlark and the rattlesnake. Bigger? Sure. It's only about 10 sentences long. Um, who here remembers the word wahochbi from earlier on? Anyone remember? Wahochbi. Yeah, nest. It was the word for a nest. Wahochbila is a little nest. Cute little nest. Um, this is the story of a, a rattlesnake who approaches a meadowlark nest with four or five little baby meadowlarks in there. And instead of freaking out, the mother meadowlark says, Uncle Rattlesnake, how nice of you to visit. Thank you for coming. I haven't seen you in so long. I'm going to cook you a meal and welcome you in the proper way. Hey, old Elderspawn, why don't you fly off and find us a kettle so we can cook your Uncle Rattlesnake a feast? And so the eldest um, meadowlark flies off and they wait around for five minutes, ten minutes pass, and the eldest born doesn't come back. So she says, wherever could he be? And sends off the next in line, the second born child, to go and look for his older brother and to bring back a kettle together. Five minutes pass, ten minutes pass, and that meadowlark doesn't return either. So she sends off the third meadowlark to go and look for them. Fourth meadowlark, fifth meadowlark, and until eventually the nest is empty, at which point she turns to the rattlesnake and says, ha, as if anyone would ever cook for you, and flies off and they're all, they all live happily ever after. Um, but the, the point is that this is quite a formulaic text. It's a story that's quite repetitive. There's language, there are verbs that are used throughout. Um, uh, so one of the activities that we did with this particular text was identifying the word iyaya, to depart, to depart from a nest, in its various forms. So they're getting conjugation practice, not in a dry way, not in a way that would involve filling out a conjugation table, but by interacting with a story that their grandparents would have known. Um, just to end with... I'm going to show you two more little projects. The legend of the end of the world told in Lakota by the Mars taken alive. Thank you. 
You might not have taken a lot away from that story without the vocabulary, but um, with the sort of foundation that we give our college students, plus the you know facility that animation offers, um, they can really engage with that text in a way that doesn't require any reliance on English. And um, uh, projects like these are incredibly important for um, you know. Uh, engaging with those stories in a more traditional Lakota immersion um, uh, sort of environment. Um, so th there are a couple of more projects, but I'm going to leave it there and hand over to questions. I just want to kind of conclude on the idea that um, the, uh, these texts, you know, we've only really seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, how beneficial these texts can be to learners of the language. And the more we can overcome the challenges of geography and actually reclaiming tribal ownership of these texts, the more we can um, overcome simple technical details about orthography, and the more we can show that writing Lakota isn't necessarily a corruption of the language, but a representation of authentic language, then the easier it will become to uh, reintroduce these texts into the, into the community and hopefully with that um, uh, ensure that these stories and the knowledge um, written into the memoirs and autobiographies and the other texts that are out there is passed on to the next generation of learners. Uh, so that's why we're doing this. Wopula. Yeah, there, um, the uh, orthography that's used at Standing Rock contains about 10 or so um, characters that aren't in the English alphabet. They're all Unicode characters, and the keyboard layout has been designed. It's installed on most of the computers in the schools. There's also a very good um, desktop dictionary that has been produced with um, audio recordings of pretty much every word in there, 
they sat in a studio up in Bismarck, North Dakota for days on end, just reading through the dictionary and recording word by word. And so when you look up a word in the dictionary, you can hear it pronounced by a fluent speaker. And the credit for that project goes to the Lakota Language Consortium, which is a nonprofit um, that works with various um, technical projects, I guess, mostly across, across Lakota country. Yeah. And is there generally internet access, uh, good broadband speed, etc., etc., in the community? Uh, yes. Um, the, the resources that we design have to be mobile compatible because most people have access to the internet through their phones and don't necessarily have a computer at home. Um, so um, apps that we've worked on in the past um, have always been made, you know, primarily focusing on, on mobile applications. In the Ulrich's dictionary and now grammar, it was produced, which are amazingly, uh, obviously, you know, thorough and mm. very readable. Are they, did they get sort of, you know, distributed to schools and things over there? Is there any sort of... Um, Did the Dakota Indian Foundation produce it, I think, Yeah, the Dakota Indian Foundation, I think, were one of the sponsors for the dictionary. I'm not sure who sponsored the grammar. I think the North Dakota Humanities Council was one of the sponsors. Um, they're certainly available for purchase and, you know, 50 bucks a pop. It's relatively cheap for a grammar of its, of its size. Um, I don't think there's any kind of free distribution to schools. That would be nice if the money was there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. I'm curious about the people uh, that the, we saw trying to write down and the, the stories that you have there. So the fluent speakers that you have, mm. do they know the stories already or do they actually get to uh, reconnect with them via the text. So how much of the knowledge is still with the fluent speakers? Mm. At Standing Rock, we're, we're blessed to have a number of um, very eloquent and um, uh, um, let's say um, very wise storytellers on our readers. Some of them speak the Lakota language, some of them don't, but they know and they know the stories and are able to tell them in English. There are others who are fluent speakers but don't necessarily know the stories. So for them it is a, it is a moment of reconnection and, and discovery. Um, the, all of the students within our class are second language learners, so they came to this college chorus as, as complete beginners who may know some of the stories, may be familiar with the content of the stories, and that helps them to understand and engage with the texts. Um, but this is possibly the first time they're ever engaging with them in Lakota. It's actually not a question, it's just a comment. I mean, when you've referred to text, usually they've been uh, traditional stories, haven't they? Yes. But a lot of the things like um, so, you know, Beagle and others have were actually not, not really traditional stories, but just accounts of life and, or, you know, speeches of, for instance, uh, Beagle has these things which are speeches of the chiefs. Yes. You know, crazy Horse talking, and City Horse talking, etc. Yeah. Which, you know, also very, very interesting. Then there are modern things about life in South Dakota, aren't there? Yeah. Where people lived in the 30s and you know, people who went on the Buffalo Bills, you know, um, show to England. Yeah. They're, you know, they're also very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, there's, um, it's a, a good point to make that the, a lot of these texts are very secular as well. They're not necessarily, not everything is a sacred text. There are a lot of um, narratives of daily life, recipes, um, uh, instructions for, you know, how to, um, how to make, you know, work with beadwork or quill work, which are valuable in their own way as well, of course. Yeah. There are lots of things that I want to ask you, but we can have a chat later, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. Um, can I ask about the orthographies that have been created? Um, you have this whole list, um, and um, 
at the end those who will buy this checking which uh, you know it to be an author right. book there. Do they do they consult anybody when they create these author reviews? Um, are they like um, so, some some organizations conduct or book workshops for example, like mm -hmm. a community buy it, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The orthography that I'm most familiar with, which is the Auric orthography, um, it's claimed that there were a number of fluent speakers consulted on the devising of the orthography. Quite how many speakers were actually involved, you know, is, is a different question. And even if two or three speakers are involved, then what input do the rest of the Lakota population get, get in, in it? You know, the... The fact is there's been quite a um, strong and relentless campaign by the linguists and educators to use this orthography. Uh, it wasn't necessarily conducted in the not necessarily conducted in the the most tactful way sometimes, but you know we are at a stage now where we are, and that is uh, that is that most teachers are prepared to use it in the schools, that everyone's on the same page. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you said mention of it's, it's, it's not really about the utility of the orthography, it's, it's about, as they say, it's about power, it's, it's about, it um, yeah, relationship with the community. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I remember talking to people a long time ago, older people, uh, about orthographies and, and traditional people often preferred ones which didn't have lots of accents mm -hmm. because they thought it yeah. made it look foreign. Right. It's, it's really a, it's a naive uh, uh, attitude, but it's their attitude. So yes. They didn't like accents, you know, right? and, yeah. and they, the older ways of writing the case were really just like English, but they used certain things like they used a J for je coming mm -hmm. from French. And they used an R for her, also coming from French, because they were the only ones who were affected by French by her. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of those fluent speakers who are writing in the language tend to use whatever system works for them at the time of writing. It's not necessarily consistent. They don't necessarily have a system in place. Um, and you know, whatever they're writing the language, and that's that's a beautiful thing. And um, Time will tell, you know, whether this orthography that is kind of becoming standard, whether it will, you know, last. Maybe it's a useful learner's orthography, and then once people are fluent again, they will find other ways of writing in maybe a more simple, more technologically adaptable way than what we have at the moment. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you.